one uh, covers a topic which every developer needs to deal with sooner or later. So what are the most difficult things to cope with? Tobias, do you know that as a developer? Of course. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, naming things? Uh, caching? That's it. Oh. Right? So, <laughs> definitely. So, <laughs> this is probably also about caching. Um, I don't know yet, but it's definitely about high performance websites uh, despite having dynamic content. So, even if, if that is possible at all. So, I'm very uh, curious about the talk by Stefan Bruckmann. And as I mentioned, he's talking about high performance websites despite dynamic content. Here you go. What's the most annoying thing while browsing the web? Is it ads? Well, they're kind of useful. They generate money for a service. And we have an ad broker, so problem solved. Is it trolls? We have a built-in filter for stuff like that, which usually works pretty good. Is it bad connections? We have to be patient if you are outdoor or traveling by train. So that's not really a problem. We know that is an issue. For me, it's slow websites. So I click a button and nothing happens. Maybe a spinner. But is it working? Do I have to click again? Was that an error? Do I have to wait? I hate the situations. And it's super important to have a fast and reactive website. So Amazon told us that if they would have a lag of one second on the Amazon website, they would have 1.6 billion loss in a year. So that's a lot of money. Okay, Amazon is a big site, but you'll lose customers if you have a slow website. That's by definition. Welcome to my talk about high-performance sites despite dynamic content. I'm Stefan Bruckmann. I'm Managing Director, Development at Jungformat Tech in Zurich, Switzerland. And currently, uh, we have a lot of home office headquarters uh, because of the situation you know, probably. But what makes a performant website? technical view, we need fast response of the server, point one. Then we need a fast transportation over the network. And of course, we need uh, a fast rendering in the browser. So just the browser got the data and he has to create some visual representation of your data. This needs time too. For the user, it's simple. It just have, has a feeling about the fast, responsive site, or not. So in this talk, we have these four topics, Sir, the network, the browser, and the feeling of the client, of the visitor of the website. First, the server. And if you make it simple, we just need efficient code and maybe more power on the server. Then we have a fast response of our data. Then regarding the network, we need maybe smaller files and fewer of them so that we have a faster transmission. And in the browser, we need valid code and maybe less elements so that we have a fast rendering in the browser. And the feeling, the feeling is, it needs to be, it, it needs to feel fast. It's something you can't measure really, but it has to be reactive and uh, fast loading times and interactions. And this we can solve with asynchronous operations. 
and what's a special sauce? How we, how does we get do we get to a good result? We need awareness. We need awareness in the whole project. So this starts with the developer, goes over to project managers and to the client. Everybody in the project needs to be aware that we have to build a fast website. And we need to test it. So how do we test the feeling? One thing is we can test with page speed and tools like that. We can um, test all the networking stuff, uh, but we also have to test with real users how they interact with the website and how they feel about it and where they find a pain we can solve. And a little bit, and we need a little bit of fake it till you make it. So, more on that later. One solution could be above the fault. This concept uh, is pushed by Google a lot, and it means we just load the data, stylings, and scripts for the first portion of the website, and everything else we load later. And it's not always so easy to, to, to implement especially with a content management system with um, dynamic content. And it would be even better if you scroll down and maybe the content is not loaded now that we create skeletons that we can show to the, to the visitor, here is something loading, it is a product teaser. And then, bam, the product teaser is here. So that would be, would be perfect. Let's have a look at some quick wins. Um, regarding NEOS. <clears throat> the first, and of course, please use the Flowpacks full page cache package. It's super simple to integrate, just one compose require, one um, settings entry, and you're done. It generates um, a static representation of your HTML page per page. But please. <laughs> Have a look at this. Um, if you have even just one uncached Fusion prototype in the page, the whole page cache isn't static. So please remove uncached Fusion stuff and resolve it asynchronously. And regarding the transportation, um, compress your HTML. Just it, it's simple, but do it. Costs nothing, and maybe it helps a bit. And please um, compress your assets via your web server. So this, this helps a lot to reduce the data which needs to uh, be transported over the network. And a simple feel-good op optimization would be just to remove content and features. But <laughs> yes, of course, we can do that. Um, so let's try to make the content and some features asynchronous so that they can load the main page, but asynchronously load more content and features into it. But yes, that's not that simple. And let's head over to some examples. We built, together with Bomb Connect, we built an online career choice fair. So this is usually uh, an offline event. And where you can have a look, what, is, what job is the right for me? And of course, with uh, COVID, there was no way to make an offline fair. So we created an online experience um, with a three-day event. Uh, with six parallel live video talks about different job descriptions, and this changed every 15 minutes. And we had, of course, a home uh, website, a schedule page, uh, several overview pages, and, and detailed job description pages. And on each page, we had changes every 15 minutes to um, introduce the next la or the or current live speaker and so on and 
Yes, a lot of uncached requests every 15 minutes could definitely blast our server. So our plan was to make the client intelligent. What does that mean? So, as an example, we have here the schedule page. We have a known set of timestamps and speakers. We know them. And they should not change during the event. And this way, the browser is able to know what's happening right now and what's happening in the future. So we decided to cache the structured data in the browser and manipulate the rendering in the browser itself. So every 50 minutes, we not reload the page or let the user reload the page. We just automatically update the site because we have the cached, all the structured data cached in the browser. We can do that automatically. And we don't need to invalidate the static cache on the server. The manipulation uh, we did with uh, Alpine.js. So what's what and why Alpine.js? <coughs> Next to Neos, we use Nox.js, and you probably know this already. And because of Nox.js, we learned to use Tailwind CSS, a really powerful um, CSS framework. And because of that, we have seen Alpine.js. It's a kind of uh, a low, uh, lightweight interpretation of view. So we know you from Nuxt, we have Tailwind, and we have Alpine.js. So we thought that's a good idea to combine Neos with Tailwind and Alpine.js to have some kind of the application, the client-side application feeling of Nuxt, the power of Neos, and Tailwind. And if you're interested in using Tailwind, with Neos, have a look at the Carbon Rollup package. It's really well uh, implementation of Tailwind for Neos. So let's have a look at the code. Here is the one of the components of the schedule page, the main entry. So we have. Here in the initialization of Alpine.js, we inject all the items. So we have there a JSON object with all the data of all items. And below, we have the rendering of all other items. So we have a server-side rendering of all items. We have a, a default HTML structure of all, of all talks and all speakers. And we have the... Um, the JSON object with all information about timing, which talk is when visible in life, etc. And here a simple example: the Alpine.js uh, JavaScript component could look like this to change the days. It's a limited example here, so it's pretty simple to integrate an Alpine.js component in Neos. But let's have a look at the next pages. So this is the overview pages over all job descriptions and profiles. So we have a huge list of profiles and a huge list of filter possibilities. And here we label all the currently live elements, for example, and we can filter for uh, text and for text. This is all solved in Alpine.js. No server request needed. And again, we have a known set of timestamps and speakers. So we can generate the whole list. Um, they should not change during the event. And the browser is able to know what's happening right now and in the future. But this one, we also cache all the structured data, but we 
don't render in the server. We just render in the browser. And we load the data asynchronously. So we just load the outer part of the website, the default stuff. And then we load via a JavaScript request all the data which we need to show all the items. And of course, again, with Neos Tailwind and AlpineJS. <coughs> and this is the one example of that. <coughs> I'm sorry. So, and the difference here is we not generate um, the items itself, we generate just the templates. So a template for, for the grouping mechanism, template for the item, template for the profile pictures, etc. This is the, the grouping. And again, we have here just Alpine JS attributes and the representation from the JSON object data. So this is in even this one, this looks like a normal props, uh, like a normal property, but this is just uh, the next template component for Alpine.js. So in, in Fusion, we don't render real data, we render just templates without any real data. So let's have a look. Um, for example, this one, the props has image. In Fusion, the result of this props has image is just the name of the variable in the JSON object. And it renders to a valid Alpine.js component, which is run by JavaScript. So it's kind of, of, of crazy to create such a component, but it makes it super easy to, to create dynamic fusion prototypes which can be reused in different Alpine JS components. So now we have a fully cached placeholder page with a basic DOM structure and we load the front-end application, uh, which is Alpine.js, basically, the framework, which is interpreting um, the templates we give to him. And we load via asynchronous uh, data the prefetched JSON file um, directly into Alpine.js, and we let the browser render all the content. So if you have JavaScript disabled, this page won't work. But a lot of uncached requests could still blast our server. So that's not really, could always happen. So let's harden the backend rendering. Of course, you have to use Redis. Point one. But also the flow queries can be very expensive. And if you load so many um, items and profiles, that's a problem. Of course, we used Elasticsearch for that. And as mentioned before, um, we have a, a search on the website, or multiple searches, and they are just client-side. We use Elasticsearch only to make the flow queries faster. So basically to don't have flow queries, sadly. <laughs> Let's shortly talk about architecture of the server. So we ended up with a pretty simple architecture. So we have default LAMP stack with Redis and an Elasticsearch attached to it. That's fine. We could just add a CDN. We have static content. It's, it would be super simple to add a CDN or just a proxy cache, something like that. Uh, or you could go crazy and do it your own. 
and add load balancer with several servers. So it would be easy to manage all that. But what can go wrong at this point? So we have asynchronous data, uh, we have fast um, backend rendering, fast frontend rendering, and we have dynamic reloads, we have transport caching, all that. What can go wrong? So this can go wrong. Uh, human error. So we had uh, calculated what, what server we need, um, what traffic we expect, and it was more. So uh, we did run into max connections and failed uh, right at the beginning of the first live event, uh, a lot of connections. So I think two thirds we lost at the first. So we had to, incre had to increase this uh, very fast. And then it was did run just smoothly. But would there be a workaround? Well, yes. Yes and no, of course. But let's have a look at service workers. Uh, service, service workers, we have just we have the browser, and if the network with the server, the back. So this way, we can cache page loads in the browser. So if the network is broken, we are offline, or the server is offline. Both can happen. Um, we can use the cached data in the browser and keep the site up and running. This would have, would have helped if the visitors already visited once again the website. So we need to fill up the cache. If you're the first time on the website, this does not help you. And what's coming next? Lazy loading for images. Well, in, uh, usually it's super easy. Just add side guys lazy bones package, and you have lazy loading fully responsive images out of the box. It's super cool, super efficient. It makes totally sense um, because we had this custom implementation of rendering in the browser and uh, delivering the content and all the image. Uh, assets via the external JavaScript uh, request. We did not implement it this yet, but we added it. And now back to the web app. On the left, we see um, our overview page uh, of the profiles with the search and the filter mechanism. And on the right, it's just, it's one of the profile pages. So we have a lot of components on this website. So we have, of course, search. We have the filter, which is which pops up. We have um, booleans to enable, disable. And on the right, we have component where you can uh, make a test about your personality to find specific types of, of job profiles faster, so with a color scheme. And during the live event, we have indicators about currently live or next in the next 15 minutes, something like that. And on the profile itself of the person, of course, too. So this person is live now or live in 15 minutes and with a ticker and all of that. And of course, we use Alpine JS, and to synchronize all these components, we add a Spruce. So it's a lightweight global state management layer. So it's a store for Alpine JS, pretty simple, uh, which allowed us to to keep all the different Alpine JS components in sync. So we have one data pool, and all the components are reacting. So we have a really really nice implementation and fast interactions. So if you change something here, add something to the favorites, we have it even in other browsers, maybe. So it's super cool to work with Alpine JS this way. A lot of components, one store, everything is updated. Let's recap now. Please do your homework. Write clean and efficient code. And create 
an appropriate architect should think about it twice. Test it different ways, optimize it and test again. I know it needs time, but please test and optimize. If you see something, change it, optimize it. And if it, it increases your visitor's experience, just if, go as asynchronous as possible. Fake it till you make it. That's the point. Thank you. And thank you, Stefan, for this uh, nice talk. We tried to fake it until we now have to make it and come up with good questions because oh, you almost said everything already. Um, but nevertheless, we're glad to have you here um, connected with you, Stefan. From where are you calling in? <laughs> Hi, thank you. From, s from Switzerland, of course. From good old Switzerland. Is it 12, 12 <laughs> points for Switzerland? 12 points for Switzerland, <laughs> right, yeah. So um, s you, you talked a lot about uh, the performance in, in the front end, I would you know, say. Uh, so what about uh, write um, operations? If you have applications with a lot of write operations and still need to come up with a performance front end, uh, would that change uh, your concepts or uh, what What else would you need to do to deal with that? It depends where the right it action depends. happens. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, n not really. You can cache the static co content. Each request can be static and it can be held in a CDN without changing until you have done all your right uh, actions mm -hmm. yeah okay so um i guess you you have to get used to uh, this whole approach a bit uh with a lot of asynchronity uh i i would think that lots of backend developers are used to um handle process things uh in a very synchronous way so do you think that that's a different mindset uh, to, to create these kinds of solutions or is, did it feel Not like really. a different mindset to um, you you have i think you have more control in if you have processes in the back end so you have more control about uh, the finishing of the uh, single processes and in the browser, we have not the, the full control about uh, all the actions you, you initiate. Mm -hmm. So a lot can, can fail and can fail silently. So it's a bit of scary to relate on asynchronous actions. When you, when you say uh, there's a lot going on at the, at the, on the client side, um, is it harder to test such applications? Definitely, yes. Yeah, but how how do you do that in a in a bigger scope? I mean, uh, y um, do you do kind of some kind of load testing, uh, client based, or how do you approach that? Well, we we do load tests, but not against the full page load, including asynchronous uh, requests. Uh, we load tests. Uh, each and every request, so the, the simple HTML requests and the asynchronous endpoints, mm -hmm. but not together. Yeah. And does it change much between uh, desktop clients and uh, mobile phone clients, for example? Is that a big difference nowadays? Well, the, the mobile clients are ex extremely powerful, especially in Switzerland. Um, <laughs> in, in other countries, you have, well, it, it, it is, it is. Um, <laughs> we have to think about uh, low networks and, and cheaper phones. And if you have the, the, the main market in Switzerland, you can, uh, you can think about more powerful devices. And so it's not Android it's 4 correct. anymore for, for Switzerland. Okay, that, that, <laughs> that's a luxury. Um, that's, that's good to know. Um, how, how important is it to know uh, about the infrastructure powering all that? I mean, your approach is mostly client-based or uh, puts a lot of 
um, calculation into the client. But there are certainly also some things you can do on the infrastructure side, like, I mean, traditional caching solutions and, and all that. Um, do you still use that? Do they still play an important role or is that shifting to the client? No, absolutely. You need to to do the basics, the basics on the server and to transport caching and all that. So we have good old uh, caching mechanisms uh, in the internet and we have to use them. Mm -hmm. So everything which is asynchronous has to be on top of that. Um, I was definitely offline for a short time, so... Ah, you missed part of my question. Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, let me try to say it again. Um, you showed a piece of code uh, which uh, had the fusion code, I think it was, where you had the template and then you said um, in there you have Alpine JS markers which the client will then load the data into when, when it's loaded. Um, does it make it more difficult for the developer to know which part of the code is um, executed when and when they're developing to know which parts are responsible? Yes. Yes. And yes. <laughs> 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 if you jump into an, into such a project, uh, you have to look <laughs> have to look closely which component is it. So are you in the back end, in the fusion back end, or are you in the front end? Um, it's usually there is something like it, there's a tag template and then it's clear, but not always because we also had uh, components which was loaded in another template and then you don't see it in, in the AFX itself. So it's again uh, the first problem, naming things and mm -hmm. you have solved it. Okay. Right. Okay. So we really learned uh, again uh fake it till you make it and uh <laughs> what comes to my mind is uh, that old talk uh fake performance patterns if i'm right if i'm not mistaken uh back then in colbermore at the inspiring conference maybe you uh, can find that somewhere online which was a very entertaining talk by do you remember sascha stotz i think um and that definitely was going into the client side area, but almost into the dark patterns, I would say, uh, which is still <laughs> something you can do to fake performance. Um, well, Stefan, you uh, showed us uh, the light pattern, right? <laughs> Not the dark pattern one. <laughs> Thanks a lot also for, for answering our questions. And greetings uh, to Switzerland. Thank you. Bye. Have a nice day. Bye.